Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Get Together, brought to you by Get Abstract. I'm Kirsten Villa Doberman, and I'm your host for today's session. So we started these videos a few weeks ago as a kind of virtual book club to hang out virtually together to talk about what we're reading, why it inspires us, and of course, how we're using these resources to help us make better decisions in our personal and professional lives, especially as we all face the paradigm shift that has been the coronavirus outbreak. So that's why we are here today. We are diving into a fascinating book, The Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz. And joining me to discuss it is Linda Wolfarth. She is the Digital Marketing Manager at Get Abstract. Linda, welcome to the show. Hi, Kirsten. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'm equally excited about talking about this book. Um, yeah, looking forward to our conversation and this little virtual book club here. Absolutely. And you've joined a few times now talking about books or abstracts that relate to the theme of simplicity. I remember you and I a couple of weeks ago talked here about Marie Kondo's theory of tidying up and got some really great tips from you. And I hope really great tips as well for the people that were listening. But tell us what drew you to this book, The Paradox of Choice, especially given the current context. OK, yeah, um, actually, I've been reading and like listening to podcasts about simplicity for quite a few years by now. And, and of course, the Mary Kondo theme was something I was super interested in. I dived a bit into minimalism. And then interestingly, it was a book about um, children's education that brought up this concept of choice and how children are so overwhelmed with too many choices that I thought, that's actually a very interesting topic and it's not often related directly to simplicity. So I started to read more about that and, and, and dig further into it of what's available. And then I discovered um, this book by Barry Schwartz, which I think is very good. Um, he also did a TED talk about the same topic with slightly different examples, I think. And um, yeah, I. It's really a simple concept in, and it's so far it fits the whole simplicity theme that we're discussing here, um, but very impactful, so. Yeah, and it's so relevant, I think, right now because so many people are facing situations, whether in their family lives, their personal lives, or their work situation, where so many choices have been eliminated. And so people are having to operate within this realm of having fewer choices. And that might spur some anxiety, but actually Schwartz argues that paradoxically, fewer choices can actually lead to greater happiness, more satisfaction and contentment. And what's really interesting about that paradox is that, you know, Linda, you and I have the great privilege of having grown up in um, very wealthy countries. I grew up in the United States. Um, you can tell us about your, your childhood in, in Germany, um, but we grew up with a lot of choice and associating choice with freedom, whereas, many people who live in maybe less developed societies or um, you know, in poor nations, they don't grow up with choice, but we did. But Schwartz argues that doesn't necessarily lead to happiness. Um, can you talk about a little bit about that paradox and maybe how you've seen it work itself out in your own life? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's one of the main ideas that Schwartz brings up, which is this, if you think about what could bring bigger welfare to to our societies um, and he says this is really it's very true for the western societies then you would think of course um more more freedom the more the higher the greater freedom that an individual has the the easier it is to create welfare and and then he says how it's not really so true because it's more freedom you would think would come with more choices and that would just make you happier and give you more options. But, but then there is this paradox that there is a, um, this choice paralysis. When you have too many choices, it's, suddenly it's not an opportunity anymore. There's just too much. You're overwhelmed. You, don't, you have no idea what to do. So you don't, you don't choose at all or, or you choose something, but then you still have in mind there were all of these other choices that I could have made, 
maybe my friends or neighbors or co-workers they took other decisions they made other choices did they do better or not and then and then you keep thinking about this and it 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 hinders you in in um in being happy and 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 content yeah and you mentioned growing up in different um yeah countries and even continents so i would be super curious to hear um how you think that that whole paradox or this these opportunities you had in your, in your childhood how how was that for you yeah. Well, you know, it's funny when I was introduced to this concept and read the abstract and there's just so many good nuggets in here. So I just really, really encourage everyone to sign on and to read uh, the review of Barry Schwartz's book because there's so much goodness in there. I just kept being struck by the impression. This is so America. <laughs> <laughs> um, America is the land of opportunity, the land of choice. You walk into the grocery store, there's 50 different types of cereal. Barry Schwartz talks about in his TED talk that you walk into the electronic store and with the stereo equipment that they have there, there are six and a half million different types of stereo system that you could make from combinations of the parts that they have in that store. Mm -hmm. And not only is that the situation that I grew up in, but it's also a huge part of the national psychology. And I think especially for being raised by baby boomers who grew up in a time where the Soviet Union was enemy number one, they received all these messages that in Soviet Russia um, or in communist countries, people have no choices. They have to wait in bread lines for days on end and they only have one type of cereal, whereas you have 50. And so there was really almost a, a philosophical contrast juxtaposing freedom against tyranny. But what I love that Barry Schwartz talks mm -hmm. about is that too many choices can actually be tyranny. And where I have seen mm -hmm. that work itself out in American, American culture, especially among millennials, um, our generation, is that we feel like we've been presented with all these choices, but there's this latent dissatisfaction and discontentment with the abundant materialism that our parents wanted to give us. And we've seen that that doesn't really matter. And I think you're seeing that's what's driving some of these moves toward um, more ethical supply chain, cutting back, minimalism, things like Marie Kondo, throwing things out that don't spark joy, because we're now kind of the backlash against that um, overly materialistic consumer consumeristic culture. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, and it, it is also interesting. I thought um, coming over to Europe that um, I would, it would be a very, very similar culture to the United States, but it, it really is not. It's like a nice middle ground. I feel like people are much more conscious of, um, of the choices that they make and have a sense of contentment and a lack of disappointment if there aren't 5,000 different types of deodorant in the, <laughs> the apotheca. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know what, I, what I find interesting that I'm not really sure how this is developing. I was thinking about like when I was growing up and the like opportunities or choices I had. And when I think back now, when I finished school and, uh, and I had to decide what to do then, that there were like different paths of, of studies you could take or education programs, but it was more like maybe rather technical or one of the um, natural sciences or education or business. And once you had chosen between these, what felt to me like five to 10 fields, then you would decide if you want to move further away or not, or bigger or smaller city. And that, mm. Even looking back, it seems quite simple, but I, I, I know that from my younger cousins, for example, there are these study guides now that have like over a thousand different um, study courses that you can start. And it's, this is overwhelming as well. And I don't really know when that happened. So maybe Europe is sometimes like coming a bit after. <laughs> The, what yeah. you probably already discovered a bit earlier in the US. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I feel yeah, like absolutely. I was almost yeah. a little bit glad that I I didn't have to choose between so many um, university um, choices and, and, and locations. Somehow I didn't feel yeah. that open back then as I think it would now. Yeah, it definitely is always 
changing. Um, and that's why if the society doesn't put the constraints on us, Schwartz talks about in his book that we have to create our own boundaries. Um, and he talks about how constraints, again, to use the word of the hour, paradoxically, um, lead to more freedom and more happiness. And this is something I'd love to hear from you, especially um, being a mother uh, with your children and how you parent. I'm sure it comes a lot into it, but it's actually something that before I studied uh, political science and doing the work that I do now, I actually studied drama. And one of the principles that we worked on in our acting course was that actually, to be boundaryless in whether you're performing a scene or, um, you know, reciting a sonnet or whatever it is that you may be doing. If you have too many options, you can't create. So you have to impose your own kind of boundaries. Like even just saying like, this is the audience and I'm going to perform in this direction is creating a boundary because you can't just turn to the side and perform to this direction. Right? So you have to create artificial boundaries for yourself um, in order to be more creative and what the boundaries do is they lessen the amount of time and emotional energy that you need to put into making many other smaller, less significant decisions. And that's what Schwartz talks about. As he says, there should be constraints that you put into place so that some decisions become automatic so you can focus your time and emotional energy on making the decisions that matter. How have you worked that out or found that with your daughter or you know, in your own family situation? I'm sure that you see a lot of benefit in introducing constraints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, it was really this topic of choices that I discovered it when reading about uh, children and how to raise them. And I found it so fascinating. I mean, um, there's a book called Simplicity Parenting, which mentions that. And it's he says that the author claims that um, young children in in like rich countries have these stress symptoms that sometimes children growing up in, in areas that are really um, much worse off or even, even um, civil war areas. And they have the same symptoms, not because of one dramatic thing that happened in their life, but this constant stress. And, he's, and they, the author, author said one of the main things to improve that is to just provide less choices to, to your children because it makes their lives simpler and they are happier. And then I started to think about how that also would work for myself. And it's actually, it's very often the same, the same thing. And the, the life of our children is not so much different from our own lives always. <laughs> so when you mentioned these 50 types of cereals, I don't need that. I think my daughter doesn't need them. So we have one type and, and that's what we have. And next time we buy something we could change it and buy something else, but we don't have to do the choice every single day. That's also something Schwartz mentions. You have these, these opportunities and you can like have a lot of different foods, but also like work from wherever you want. But this also means you have to decide each and every time. And it, and it, it's probably just not very useful to, to be busy with these small decisions all the time. So yeah, maybe an, another just super small um, example is that our kid, she has shoes for nice weather and she has one for the wet and ugly weather and, and that's it. <laughs> and, and I started to introduce that for myself that I have a pair of black shoes for winter and one brown and then it's usually whatever you wear, it's quite obvious which, which shoes you choose. And and then I still have some more shoes that that I have from previous times, but I, I also realized I don't wear them so much anymore because it's so simple to yes. just go with black or brown in the morning. And that's it. Yeah. You limit it down to yeah. one decision, but right? Black or brown. That. You know, um, in, interestingly, when I moved overseas, I had to, you know, I could not bring you know, a, a truckload of things over with me. I had to make selections. I had to choose um, what things I wanted to bring, not only memories and personal items, but also clothing. And so I will say my parents have a lot of my clothing in their basement <laughs> still. Um, but it was one of the great joys was releasing half of my closet 
And now I have many fewer options, but I'm just as satisfied and content with them, if not more, because that's a lot less choosing that I have to do every morning. Another really practical example of this is in the midst of the lockdown that that we all um, are either in, if you're watching this now, or we're in, if you're watching this later, um, after, the, after the lockdowns are over. But cooking options, when you're cooking three meals a day inside the house, and you're not used to that, you're used to grabbing a bite here or there, or packing a lunch or something. Uh, and for a family, or you and your husband, the eternal question, okay, what are we having for dinner? <laughs> Every day, you have to face that question. We ended up ordering a meal delivery service, one of these where they send you the options and you can cook it at home three times a week. And it's so amazing because now we can talk about other things. Your mind is so freed up to focus on work and things that actually matter rather than having to think about a, some beautiful creative idea for what we should do for dinner every single day. Um, which actually leads me to um, the point about about comparison. And I think that's something that we should touch on before before we leave this conversation, because you mentioned it briefly, that comparison, comparing your choices to the choices of others can often lead to a lot of unhappiness. Um, how would you do you have some some tips? I you know, we're all on social media all the time, especially even more so now. Do you have any tips or things that have worked for you to help with some of that comparison? There's a great quote, compare and despair doesn't lead to happiness. Um, any thoughts or practical wisdom that you have on on getting rid of that comparison demon? That's actually, I find that a tough question and I'd love to give that back to you in one or two minutes um, because I think it's, it's really a whole mindset. It's not so much about um, you, you constrain your, your social media time and your phone by limiting the app like Instagram or Facebook to run like 10 minutes a day or something. That is certainly something you can do. But for me, it's really more a, a complete mindset of how, of who I am, how I perceive myself com compared to others or actually comparing less and less. Um, and that's also what, what Schwartz says, these, these comparisons and maybe social media has really accelerated that, that you, you are able to compare yourself to much more people than ever before. Um, it's not really helping us to feel happy. So yeah, I, I would be really curious to to hear what what your experiences are with this because it's um, it's quite a big a big thing and a, a kind of a life decision. I feel if you if you even allow yourself to to compare yourself or your life. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're social beings and we can't help but compare ourselves and our lives to others, whether we're on Instagram or not. Um, so I think that's inevitability and Schwartz talks about that. And one concept that he introduces that I really like is, you know, you can compare upward or you can compare downward and comparing upward means, OK, you're comparing with the mindset of these people or this person or this situation is better than mine. It could be so much better if only looking up, seeing how you don't measure up. Whereas if you compare downward, it's looking and saying, wow, look at how lucky I am compared to situations where people have so much less or people have gone through so much grief and tragedy in their life. And I can, you know, look at my life and not saying in any way at all that you're better than those people, but saying this is a situation that could be, but this is where I am. And I'm so thankful to be here when looking at what could have been. And so if we're going to compare, it's shifting the framework of how we do that and saying, I'm thankful for where I am because it could be a lot worse. And then using that to motivate gratitude. And that's really where I think we should act in. And Schwartz does such a great job. And again, I encourage everyone who's watching this to read the full review because it's so brilliant. And to watch his TED Talk. He he really weaves this beautiful tapestry of going back and forth between like the, the very academic and um, practical ways of looking at the toxicity of choice, but also kind of like the, the more spiritual and psychological element and how important gratitude is. Um, Linda, I, I'd love to hear your voice. Do you think we're getting better at that as a culture, especially in the context of Corona? Do you think that we're growing some spiritual wisdom coming out of this or 
What's your prognosis? Are you optimistic <laughs> or pessimistic? Yeah, I've been thinking about this, and I, as you, I really also like that in his work that he he has this balance of 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 citing all of these studies and the the neuroscientific things that are happening in our brain when we compare each other to others or not, and then and then how how he shows that having very simple um, ways to show gratitude can can lead us a bit out out of that paradox and out of this um, situation where, where we're not getting any, any more satisfied with our lives. Um, yeah, so I, I certainly think um, this is a very helpful thing. And I think if you had asked me or if we had discussed this question maybe just six or eight weeks ago, I would have thought that this whole gratitude showing and gratitude journaling and all of these little things that you can do is, is pretty much a niche thing that a few people are doing, maybe those that are maybe a little bit drawn to, to the spiritual practices, I don't know. Um, and that it's, that it's not very common and probably the society as a whole is, is more aiming towards this more and like earning more, buying more, consuming more, having these more choices, running after something that feels like you can change with with more more money more choices and so on and and right now as we're already six eight weeks into this um lockdown and a bit more isolated life um i feel that there is a lot of of good things happening so that people really appreciate what they have um like being surrounded with your family, even though it's not always so crazy <laughs> as a whole thing. I mean, it's it's very nice, um, or not to, having to commute and have have more time left. There's a really a lot of things that, with reduction, have have become bigger for us. And I think that is a is a very um, positive thing among amongst all of this. Um, definitely um worrying uh, situation yeah absolutely did, did you observe I, to observe a similar thing or what was your um impression of where society is going you know in the limited ways we're able to observe society at the moment <laughs> it mostly yeah, seems like it's through the, through the lens of online or from your balcony <laughs> watching the people down down mm -hmm. below uh, after the initial wave of anxiety that hit a lot of people, I think because of all of the changes, I I think I'm, I'm hearing from um, groups of my friends as well as colleagues and our families, my husband and I's families, is that people are finding ways to adapt and embracing life in the new normal. And that will still change. And that actually leads to kind of the, the last concept in in Barry Schwartz's book that I just really love is that we always, we anticipate very poorly what our feelings are going to be after we make a decision. We mm -hmm. anticipate that good situations are gonna make us feel better than they actually do. And we anticipate that negative situations are going to make us feel worse. When in reality, what we should do is anticipate that we will be able to adapt and cope. We are strong enough. We are equipped and that takes a choice to believe that. And so I believe rather than just, you know, listening to the news blaring and um, anticipating the worst, I anticipate that our culture is going to adapt. I believe in humans, human beings. I believe in the human spirit and I believe we will find a way to adapt that will make us better. I think we always have whenever human tragedy is struck throughout history. I'm a student of history. I absolutely love it. And every time that human tragedy has struck, humans have come out on the other side, having learned lessons and come out stronger. And so I really do believe that we're on that track. And if we decide that we will be, then we will be. <laughs> that sounds very nice and positive, yeah. Um, and you know what, interestingly, because now we, we're reading this, um, this book now and, and discussing about simplicity and it feels like this is such a, like a, trending topic right now but he wrote his book in 2004 or 5 
So that's 15 years ago. And it's interesting how also some concepts with all of our changing life situations, or either for us personally, like moving from the US to Switzerland, um, or suddenly having a daughter and a family, um, some of these concepts could really be helpful in all of these situations and, and seem to persist. I find that quite uh, fascinating that we also dis discover um, like these works and feel like, oh, this helps me right now so much. And then we realize, okay, someone thought about this 15 or 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, his work is has is definitely enduring. Um, Linda, any last recommendations or favorite favorite last words from the book as we wrap up our conversation? Mm hmm. I probably I, I recommend watching his TED talk because he's he is really a fun person, and I like this anecdote where he says he had this one pair of jeans and was wearing it all all the time until it was broken and then he went to the shop and had to try like 100 new pairs of jeans and he felt like what he just wanted to have like the one jeans that you could buy 10 years ago and then he found <laughs> one that was like better fitting than any of his jeans that he ever had but he was less happy he just had learned that there are much more choices and and that that maybe even though he was trying on these 100 pairs of jeans, he still didn't have the perfect one. I, I found that an interesting anecdote and probably we should take that more into account as we make our choices and uh, think about our consumptions and how also a lot how we spend our time. Absolutely. How about you? Great last words. And favorite um, quote? Oh, uh, yeah. I my. My favorite quote um, from the from the review and, and from the book is high expectations can be counterproductive. We probably can do more to affect the quality of our lives by controlling our expectations than we can by doing virtually anything else. So I love that. I say let's leave it there. Linda, thank you so much for joining me for this virtual book club. It was wonderful to talk with you and to hear your thoughts about simplicity and particular as it relates to choice. And thank you for bringing this wonderful book as well as TED Talk to our attention. Thanks a lot. Also, thanks a lot for sharing your experiences and thoughts. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank all of you so much for joining us. Of course, we just want to say if you heard something today that you found was really meaningful and you want to share it with someone else, please feel free to do that. We have been doing these uh, get together sessions to share these resources with you. So feel free to share. You can find this video on our Facebook page as well as on our Vimeo page and our YouTube channel. And also, Get Abstract is offering its entire library free until May 18th. So if you have not signed up for free access yet, please go on to getabstract.com and do that so that you can get some of the most reliable information from trusted sources, especially during this time. And while you're on getabstract.com, you can also sign up for our free daily newsletter, Get Context, which brings you daily articles and information in context to, of course, help you make better decisions and equip you with knowledge to, to face the daily challenges that we are all going through. So thank all of you so much for watching, and we will see you next time for another Get Together. Wherever you are in the world, we're wishing you a wonderful day, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Extraordinary challenges require extraordinary responses from thought leaders, company executives, and employees. As the coronavirus pandemic unfolds and businesses scramble to adapt to escalating containment efforts, Get Abstract is here to help organizations navigate this crisis wisely and professionally. For over 20 years, we've been committed to providing relevant knowledge from reliable sources to help people make better decisions in their personal and professional lives. In line with our mission to empower decision makers with relevant knowledge from trusted sources, we are proud to offer businesses free access to our full library until May 18. Embark on a no-strings-attached knowledge journey with GetAbstract. Sign up today.